everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna and this is day 16 of my book week. Let's get going. So I thought this would be a little fun topic to talk about. Like, we're going to be talking about forbidden books, lost books that has been, you know, lost throughout time. I thought it would be a really interesting topic to write about. So otherwise, let's get going. So the first one I thought was really interesting was the Homer's Margarites. It was before the Iliad and Odyssey, which honestly is little known about the plot of the comedic epic poem, Homer's first work that is written around 8700 BC. But there were like a few surviving lines that would describe the poems full of Shiva Margarites. He knew many things, but all gladly. And this is from Plato's Alcibiades. The gods taught him neither to think nor to plow, but nor any other skill. He failed in every craft. And that's also from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So, unfortunately, there's no copy of Margaret's exist because Aristotle had held it in high claim. So, which is unfortunate. I think it would change everything if we knew what it was. So, yeah, that's quite unfortunate. And because it kind of has like the same relationships to, to comedies as is Iliad and Odyssey, bear to our tragedies. So, that's quite unfortunate. <laughs> Number two is Lost Books of the Bible. So there are 24 books in the Hebrew Bible or Tanaki, and depending upon the denomination, between 66 and 84 more books in Christian Bibles are divided between the Old and New Testaments. So we do have missing pages from scripture on what have been become known as the lost books of the Bible. The book of Numbers, for instance, mentions the book of the battles of Yahweh, from which no copy survives. Similarly, the first and second book of Kings and first and second book of Chronicles names a book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel and the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. And there are over 20 titles of which the text is missing. Some of the quaint quotations mentioning the last books provide clues to the content. The book in seven parts, for example, likely told readers about the cities that were being divided among the Israelites. So, I feel like maybe we can find the last books of Bibles if we put our minds together. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? My third one is William Shakespeare Cardino. So Cardino has been called the Holy Grail of Shakespeare enthusiasts. There is evidence that the Shakespeare Company, the King's Men, performed the play for King James I in May 1613, and that Shakespeare and John Fletcher, his collaborator for Henry, for Henry VIII, and two normal kinsmen wrote it, but the play itself is nowhere to be found. From the title, scholars and fear that the plot had something to do with the scene in Minguel, the Cervantes, Don Quixote, involving a character named Carlino, a translation of Don Quixote was published in 1612 and would have been available to Shakespeare. Never mind that we have we would have an entirely new play of Shakespeare to watch. The work would be a direct link be direct link between the founder of the modern novel and the greatest playwright of all time. So Honestly, I, if we can find it, I think it will be great. I do like Shakespeare. I like his plays, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth. I really did like Macbeth, despite what people think about it. I just like the creepiness of it. But I still have yet to read Mid Midnight Summer Dream and Hamlet. I do really want to read those two. But yeah, so Cardino looks really interesting, so can we find it? 50-50 shot, what have we got to lose with all these advanced technologies that are keep on being complicated? I think we can find it, I think we can. My number four is Inventio Fortunata. In the 14th century, a Francisian monk from Oxford, whose name is unknown, traveled the North Atlantic. He described the geography of the Arctic, including what he presumed was the North Pole, in a book called Inventio Fortunato, or the discovery of the Fortunate Islands. He gave King Edward III a copy of his travel log around 1360, and some say an additional five copies 
Flutter among Nemo before the book was lost. What followed next was a game of telephone that stretched across centuries. In 1364, another physician described the contents of an of Inventio Fortunata to Flemish author Jacob Sinoyan, who in turn published a study in his own book, Interinarium. Unfortunately, Interinarium also went missing, but not before he got out McKenna, one of the most prestigious cartographers of the 16th century minute. McConnell, writing to an English scientist named John Dee in 1577, scribbed word for word from an in, in, internarium's description of the North Pole, in the, midst of, in the midst of the four countries as a whirlpool, pole, into which the empty space fall in drawing seas, which divide the north, and the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel, and is four degrees Wide on every side of the pole, that is to say, eight degrees altogether, except that right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone. When Mercurito published a world map in 1569, he used this description as the source for his illustration of the epic, based upon a third-hand summary of a last book Written by an unknown monk 200 years earlier. Uh, number five has got to be my favorite one, so we need all authors in hand, all brains in hand. We need to think of it. So, and this is by far my favorite one. It's Jane Austen Sandington. Let's see what it's about. When Jane Austen died on July 18, 1817, at the age of 42, she left behind 11 chapters of an unfinished novel <laughs> that, would, that would tantalize posterity as Time magazine reported in 1975. In it, protagonist Charlotte Hayward visits the seaside town of Sandington as it is being built into a resort. Austin sets the scene, develops some characters and themes, and then, just as the plot seems to take off, and abruptly ends. Several writers have sought to finish the last ending of Sandton in Austin styles, including Anne Telescombe, Telescombe an Australian born novelist, but the Jeanette's take the author like warm milk at bedtime, then Telescombe's book, according to a review in Time magazine, is watery milk. <laughs> Y'all, yeah, we gotta find the unfinished novel and finish it for her. Like, imagine how much that would change. Like, we have to find it. Let's get all the authors and then write the book. <laughs> Number six is Herman Melville's The Isle of the Cross. On a trip to Nantucket in July 1852, Herman Melville was told a tragic story of Agatha Hatch, the daughter of a lighthouse keeper who saved a shipwrecked sailor named James Robertson, then married him, only later to be abandoned by him. The tale would serve as inspiration for a manuscript titled The Isle of the Cross, which Melville presented to Harper and Brothers in 1853, but the publisher, for reasons unknown, turned it down, and no copy of the manuscript has ever been found. In an essay in the 1990 issue of the journal American Literature, Herschel Parker, a biography of Melville's claims, the most possible suggestion is that the Harpers feared that their firm would be criminally liable if anyone recognized the originals of the characters in the Isle of the Cross. I mean, fair enough, if they publish, I think they'll be really in big trouble, so I can see why they have turned it down. So that's, it's fair enough if they actually did turn it down, so. To each, to each their own, I guess. Number seven is Thomas Hardy's The Poor Man and the Lady. His first novel by Thomas Hardy was about the on-again, off-again relationship between the son of peasants and the daughter of a local squire in Dorset Shire, England. That much is made clear in the only existing plot summary of the book, a transcribed conversation between Hardy and English poet Edmund Gosset from April 1915. But Hardy, who had written the story nearly 50 years earlier, could not recall many details, including whether or not the two characters ultimately ended up together. The worst kind of cliffhanger, FYI. 
What we do know from the transcript is that in the late 1860s, Harding considered the work the most original thing that he had written, and by then he had written by many of the poems he would end up publishing decades later. Some scholars think that Hardy incorporated pieces of it into his latest works, including the poem A Poor Man and a Lady, the novella An Indiscretion in the Life of an Harris, and his first published novel Desperate, Desperate Remedies. That's luck, man. Number 8. First draft of Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It is rumored that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a 30,000 word draft of The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in just three days. Damn, I can't even write a novel in three days with that many words. Holy crap. But when his wife, Fanny Stevenson, read it, she criticized the text, saying that it would work better if the plot served as a moral allegory. What happened next is up for debate. One version of the story is that Stevenson is not taking the criticism so well, tossed his manuscript into a fireplace. But in 2000, some 150 years after the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was written a letter from Fanny Stevenson to W.E. Henley, a pink legged poet who inspired Treasure Island, long John Silver character. Turned up in the attic of one of Henley's descendants, in a letter dated 1885, Fanny called the first draft a choir full of under nonsense. That hurts, man. And said, I shall burn it after I show it to you. Whether she actually did or not is unknown. Either way, the first draft no longer exists. Stevenson rewrote the story and readers would never know the differences between his original vision and the, and the now classic tale. Number 9. Ernest Hemingway's World War I Novel In 1922, Hadley Hemingway, the first of Ernest Hemingway's four wives, put the log hat originals of several of her husband's short stories and a partial novel in a suitcase. She left Paris on a train and met Ernest in, in Lausanne, Switzerland, but en route and suitcase and its prices cargo were stolen. It was not until later that Hemingway would comment on the gravity of the loss. He once said that he would have opted for surgery if he knew it could erase the memory. And according to Stuart Kelly, author of the book of lost books, Hemingway was known to claim, usually after a drink or two, that the debacle led to his divorcing Hanley. He never attempted to rewrite the lost works, including the novel, which was based upon his own experiences in World War I, but Kelly argues there was one better. Had he spent the next ten years trying to perfect his immature jottings, we might never have seen the novels of which he was capable. And that sucks, man. Like, don't, don't be a meaning. Just give back what was original to his. Um, Number 10. Celia's Path, Celia Plath's Double Exposure in 1962, Sylvia Plath started work on a new novel that she planned to title either Double Exposure or Double Take. She, un she had 130 pages written, but the book was incomplete. Oh man, that sucks. Oh, I don't know if I can say this, but... But the book was incomplete when she committed... You know what? On February 11th, 1963. After her death, her estranged husband, poet Ted Hughes, gained control of her estate and unplemished works. When asked about the novel in a 1995 interview with the Paris Review, Hughes said, Well, what I was aware of was a fragment of a novel, but about 70 pages. Her mother says she saw a whole novel, but I never knew about it. What I was aware of was 60, 70 pages which disappeared. And to tell you the truth, I always assumed her mother took them all on one of her visits. Only one literary critic, Judith Quill, saw an outline for double, for double exposure, and she claimed that it had to do with her husband, wife, and mistress. Hughes and Platt had a troubled relationship, and so it is thought that it might have been partly autobiographical. Hughes then burned one of Platt's journals written in her last months saying in the Paris Review interview that it was too sad for her children to see. That really hurts. Oh, man. And my last one is actually really fascinating, and that is the Younger Encyclopedia Ming Dynasty. About a thousand years before Europe invented paper, the Chinese were writing away. 
Between the 11th and 14th centuries, they kept the secret of gunpowder to themselves. About 700 years before Gutenberg invented the printing press, the Chinese had a thriving printing economy. Ancient Chinese knowledge was both invaluable and centuries ahead of its European counterparts. This is why Emperor Yongle ordered the production of the Yonga Encyclopedia in 1403. A compilation of over 8,000 Chinese texts from medicine and science to cultural and music. The encyclopedia was an ambitious attempt to compile literally all Chinese knowledge in one place. The full collection included almost 23,000 scrolls across 11,095 volumes. Wow! To store it, it will require 40 cubic meters and an index of almost 16 volumes long. When the second period was completed in the early 1400s, the emperor has stored it in the Forbidden City. I love the tales of the Forbidden City. More of that, I will touch upon, but let's continue in a different video. After a close call in 1557 that almost resulted in the loss of the collection, another copy was produced. This is a miracle because about 400 volumes of this copy still survive to day. That's crazy. The other volumes of both the copy and the original have not been lost to history. Most experts believe that it was destroyed when the Ming Dynasty was overthrown. However, some have suggested that the encyclopedia may have been sealed in the tomb of the Emperor Jianjing. Only three of the Ming Dynasty tombs are open and Jia Jing's is not one of them. His tomb is unlikely to be searched in the near future, so while the answers to so many of, of questions could be right within our reach, don't expect him to find him in your lifetime. Ah, dang it. Okay, let's call up all the archaeologists and let's go find that tomb. I'm just kidding, because there's this one tomb, I keep forgetting what the name was, but there's this one tomb and apparently if you open it, the world will literally be in an Acropolis, so maybe we should not open it. So, but anyways. And actually, I do have one more, just because this one sounds really so interesting. And it's Nicolia Gogol. I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. Nicolia Gogol is viewed as one of the first and most influential writers in the golden age of Russian literature. Born in what is modern day Ukraine, Gogol was a paradigm hypochondriac who feared death and regularly fell ill. Van Gogh produced his best work when he was healthy and became essentially immobile during his time period. most famous works, Dan Souls, was based on Dante's Inferno and aimed to create a piece of work that married in Russian mortality. Upon its release, Dan Souls caused a quite an uproar during its controversial and explained passages. The religious community lashed out at Gongol who took the attacks quite personally and attempted to make amends. This is how he became involved with Father Matari Konstantinovsky, a religious leader who convinced Gogol that his work was sinful. Konstantinovsky encouraged Gogol to re-announce his work and burn whatever remained. Convinced that his immoral behavior was the cause of his illnesses, Gogol complied and burned the second part of dead souls which was near completion, he instantly regretted the decision and fell into a deep depression. After nine days without food, Gogol died. Aww. So, and, yeah. My, la my final last, what I promise, is Lost Mexican Goddess. Despite leaving behind many fabulous ruins, the Aztec and Mayan civilization are shrouded in mystery. There are still large gaps in our knowledge of how they lived, who they were, and how they disappeared. This is in part due to the passage of time, but the mere mysteries stem from the loss of the codis. The Aztec and Mayan codis, known collectively as the Mexican codis, were a collection of illustrations and texts that documented the life, history, and the culture of their people. Fewer than 30 survive today, and these have been instrumental in helping us understand the language and culture. Many of these were destroyed by Escoto, an Aztec who led a successful coup to overthrow the emperor. When he was installed, Escoto ordered the Cortes to be destroyed so that he could rewrite history, literally. When the Spanish invaded just over 100 years later, they destroyed almost all the Mayan 
corners, Diego de Landa had brutally attempted to convert the natives to Spanish culture but did not have the authority to do so. As a result, he was forced to go back to Spain and document what he had learned about the history and culture. His work was also lost, but not before other authors had described parts of it. This leaves us with check and third hand account of the lost cottage. So that concludes like the forbidden lost but these were mostly lost books instead of forbidden. So I think it's really interesting that we still have all these lost books that are just not have been found. So I think it's really interesting. Could we find it? I mean maybe we can I think one of the most realistic things maybe we can find is Mex the Mexican Cordes, even though most have them been burned is how we just slid. But I still think it's possible to find like the remainings of it somehow in some way. Or at least recreate somehow since we have AI and all these fancy technologies. I don't know. I'm just putting something out there. So, but uh, yeah, so let me know what, uh, what is interesting to you. Jane Austen is my far my favorite one. So I think as for well, all of the authors out there, I think we can come together and we can try to finish it. I think it'll be really cool as something such a huge milestone. I think we can all do it. But who knows, time will tell if anyone is up for the challenge. But otherwise, that is it for my lost books. Uh, so please like, comment, subscribe so you'll be notified every time I post. And I will see you in my next one. Bye!